Welcome to another episode of Nerdio TV. We're here with Aurora Fernley, uh, actress and director. And uh, we're here to talk a little bit about her journey and one of her projects, the Pulsar short film. So I guess we'll start with a um, big question, which is uh, where did you study and what was your foot into the industry? How did you start? Was it acting first or film first? Was it all together? Good question. Um, the first question about where I studied. So I studied at the Northern Film School in Leeds, which was a kind of three-year BA course. And I had the option to do the MA, but instead I went into industry and started a production company. But before I went into film, I was an actor, like from a very, very young age. And then I started writing plays when I was 15, 16, started directing plays when I was 18. And I wanted to go to drama school. But when I went to my auditions, they just said, you just don't have enough life experience, which I think is a nice way of them saying I was immature. So I ended up... A bit tough. Yeah, travelling. <laughs> and I ended up in New Zealand and they were doing Lord of the Rings and I ended up working on a post-production company, front of house, and just got to see how that was working. And that just kind of really changed my mind from being in front of camera to my love of film and love of storytelling and I just went straight back to film school after that. When I left university, I decided rather than doing the MA, I would go and start doing music videos. It's what I wanted to do the most at that time. Totally part of the MTV generation. I was like in love with music videos as a creative form. Um, and I set a production company with two friends. We all worked as directors. We all did the producing. We all did the first aiding, editing, everything. And in about two years' time, we got signed to a really big agency in London. That's awesome. So we were with Academy Films, which was like, we were 24. We were like had this agency in London, we were suddenly like pitching on huge projects two, three times a week, and it was great. And it was exactly what we wanted, and we got there. But the thing that was missing for me was drama. I think because I am an actor at heart, I was missing the story. So however beautiful the images were, working with you know these incredible uh, Phantom Flex cameras and doing slow motion work and this really beautiful imagery, I was missing the heart of the story. So after about three years with Left Eye Blind, I decided that I really needed to just cut the ties and go drama and just start from scratch almost. And that takes a lot of courage because you're leaving scary. all the production, commercial budget yep. to go indie basically and start again, isn't it? Yeah, I knew if I didn't do it at that point, I'd be too comfortable in the commercial sector and it would always be too risky to leave. I think the, the communication that a director needs to have is on all these different levels. And that means you'll be talking visually or you might be uh, talking about sound or you'll be talking about bodies and, and that means you need to constantly keep switching about your understanding if you've had an experience in those roles it really helps because then you know the language to speak yeah so I think people can come from anywhere and be great directors people come from editing and have an, an amazing understanding of storytelling and putting scenes together and shots together and how something fits as a jigsaw puzzle and they can see that in real time while they're on set my short film career has not been typical of what we call the UK, I don't know, ladder of uh, BFI money or UK Film Council. Most of my money's come through the internet through competitions. Well, that's that's what happened with Pulsar, isn't it? Yeah. What am I missing? Look, the answer's not on that battered old system. Pulsar came through a company um, called, it's called Enter the Pitch, just the pitch. And the pitch is where you take a concept from the Bible, any biblical story, and then you give it a kind of Sherlock reimagining. So take a story, um, the first year I did it, I think I, I was looking at Ezekiel, and this kind of idea of somebody who is potentially a schizophrenic preacher who is having visions, and so I kind of changed it into a modern day setting. Um, and then I got into the final 10, and that was great, I went to Pinewood, and it was, it was pretty much an X Factor ordeal. Um, the next year I pitched to do something called The Parable of the Prodigal of the, oh my God, what's it called? I remember now. <laughs> oh my God. Was it the prodigal son? The prodigal Probably. son. <laughs> and I did it as a Victorian period drama and I got into the final three. And then, you know, I was I was just ready to give up on it because I'd done it, I think, four times by that point. And I've been in the final every single year. And I just thought, it's 25 grand. It's more money than I can get. The, the BFI hadn't set up their money. There was no regional screen agency. There was no way to raise that kind of financing through crowdfunding at the time. Yeah. So I just went... I'm just going to do it and I'm going to go with my most ambitious idea because if I want to do this one more time, it has to be the craziest, biggest thing. So when most people shoot short films, they think that after they've shot it, this is half the battle won. Um, but then they go into the post-production process, then there's the whole film festivals or submitting their film and the marketing and getting the views. 
to get the work out there. Um, what has been your experience with this and how did you, how did you deal with it? You learn through doing it and doing it wrong, I think is the best answer. So the first kind of short film that I did um, was, a, was only a two grand UK Film Council short. And what I learned through that experience was how to be a distributor of your own work and what you needed to do in order to make that work. Um, and how much more work there is because when your film is finished it's an 18 month commitment to getting it seen and out there going through festivals and whatever budget you've put aside is not going to be enough so you kind of end up realizing that a certain amount of what you earn now becomes part of your uh, festival strategy festival budgets the PR materials picking upon things that weren't really accounted for I would say you need like 25% contingency of your budget just for things that happen in post um, and I think that's definitely true of things from like sound design to visual effects to shots you weren't expecting to need, which is really unusual because even now what you call commonplace dramas, they take a lot of visual effects work. And so I, I think that kind of budgetary aspect now is, is in my mind, it's incorporated into every project. There's no such thing as a kind of kitchen sink drama that isn't going to need some kind of touching up. So I think from my journey, I went to quite a few different schemes that helped me. So I went to um, something called Script to Screen VFX, which was in Ireland. And this was a great uh, course where we had one week in June and another week in September. And people came in from all over the world and all different kinds of productions, working from script uh, visual effects uh, supervisors who'd been working with Lars von Trier on Melancholia um, and Nymphomaniac. Uh, yeah. We actually got to hear all about this is going to sound weird because it's that's a very highly sexualized film but how they did all the vfx for that um we won't go into that but that was actually a Found revelation quite interesting. <laughs> very interesting <laughs> i did that this we had a huge conversation about the fact that they brought in porn stars who had no pubic hair and actually there was a, a huge department dedicated to keeping the consistency of pubic that hair. area <laughs> yeah. wow yeah that's, that's somebody's that's a job, job. That's somebody's job. Um, <laughs> not the okay, so guys probably don't need to know that. But you probably love to know that. That's the fun. That's the stuff I found really interesting. Was like, what what do you not consider? What becomes a huge job in a film? So we had visual effects supervisor, but everybody coming from the very beginning, which is how do you look at a script? Because I'm used to looking at a script as a director and going through and saying these are the both. Uh, you know, this is the bit where this happens. This is the story arc. These are my characters. This I'm going to think about this, putting it onto one big plan. But what I'm not used to doing is looking at it and saying where are the visual effects in this yeah and that's kind of the, the next part of the plan well this is where pulse went right and wrong because i knew right from the start that this was outside my comfort zone i'd done a lot of really interesting um short films that didn't use visual effects so much but they were using a lot of special effects and camera trickery but i knew that if we were going to set something in space and <laughs> you're on a spaceship <laughs> and there's you know there's, there's alien planets and aliens well we're going to need some visual effects definitely um but to what degree and to what level and and how would i start thinking about that so i was i was lucky again that i was able to get hold of a guy called paddy eason at invisible oh I know him very well. He's a lovely, he's a lovely man. <laughs> very lovely. <laughs> and so I got him to read the script and at an early stage when we weren't even finished on the script because what I wanted was I wanted to know if I was going down a route where I wouldn't be able to afford to make my film because there was a set budget. And so I, he was really helpful in reading it and suggesting ideas and, and suggesting changes and pointing out things that he would flag. And then he said, well, what you need is you need someone who's a really good VFX supervisor. And these are people I know who are top end compositors who want to take that step up. And that's how I got in touch with Abigail Scully. Yeah. So then she kind of read the script and was like, this would be a great project for me to be taking that transition. Um, and then from her information, from Paddy's information, I was able to start thinking about how I would shoot something differently and how much it was going to cost and how long it would take. My advice to beginner filmmakers is to understand the boundaries and the roles. Because I think what could happen on smaller, low budget projects is you can end up wearing a lot of hats and taking a lot of responsibilities. So there's an understanding of what a role is and who's got to do it and when you can step between one job and another. And when you're just starting out, you tend to wear a lot of hats and do a lot of roles. And I would say, try and get rid of that responsibility and give it to the right person, even if it means hiring more people than you're anticipating. There's a lot of what I call predators, yeah. producer, director, editors, everything. <laughs> and I don't even act... That's a great name. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't even act my own work. I think having those boundaries is really important. And 
you've got to find out that there is a difference between a, like a, a post supervisor, a visual effects supervisor, a VFX post supervisor. These are all different people that I needed on my film and they ended up being one person and that was too much for them. And so I needed to know that earlier in order to support someone to do their job well because if they've got too much on them, then they can't do what they do best and that's why they were in the project in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank being you. here today, Aurora. No, I loved it. And um, see you again in the next episode of Nerdo TV. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>